American Journal, Journal of American Medical Association, and other top journals. He is co-editor of Reviews in Cardiovascular Medicine and is associated editor of the American Journal of Cardiology. He has given numerous presentations worldwide and he is uh, president of the Cardio Renal Society of America, which is an organization dedicated to bringing cardiologists and nephrologists to work together on this emerging problem of cardiorenal syndromes. And as you can see from his presentation, this is an area of a great controversy, the overlap between how to treat AFib and heart failure with the presence of chronic kidney disease and end-stage renal disease. Hello, this is Dr. Peter McCullough from Baylor University Medical Center in Dallas, Texas, and it's my pleasure to present this uh, webinar today uh, titled Atrial Fibrillation and Heart Failure in Chronic Kidney Disease. I want to, again, thank each and every one of you for joining this um, uh, teleconference. I'll follow this outline and make a few points with respect to atrial fibrillation and heart failure uh, as they relate to patients with chronic kidney disease uh, in the pre-dialysis phase of chronic kidney disease and those who are uh, receiving renal replacement therapy. Uh, the first points are regarding atrial fibrillation, and I'm an internist and cardiologist, so I have a really kind of a medical internal medicine and cardiology um, orientation towards atrial fibrillation, but recognize uh, that it affects a lot of patients uh, that we manage with respect to chronic kidney disease and end-stage renal disease. And by way of review, uh, keep in mind that in normal sinus rhythm, uh, it takes quite a bit of coordination between the sinoatrial node uh, to have a relatively uh, coordinated uh, atrial depolarization, uh, have all of uh, those impulses arrive at the atrial ventricular node within a reasonable time span, and then have depolarization of the bundle of his and the right and left bundles to have a coordinated uh, ventricular contraction. In the setting of uh, atrial distension, uh, uh, increased uh, atrial pressures, uh, cardiac fibrosis, you know, vascular disease, ventricular disease, and cardiomyopathy, it's not hard to imagine that uh, the perfection of sinus rhythm would be lost, and in fact, uh, the atrium would uh, start to, in a sense, uh, do their own thing with respect to depolarization and repolarization. And so, in atrial fibrillation, as shown on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, there really are 600 or more uh, independent little wavelets uh, uh, um, occurring. Uh, and in fact, if we were to count the oscillations, they'd be about 600 beats per minute. And uh, so atrial fibrillation in many ways is the, the, the default rhythm as we move into older age in the presence of long-standing hypertension, diabetes, chronic kidney disease. Now, it's true that in younger individuals that uh, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation does originate out of the pulmonary veins, uh, and then we can go in and isolate those pulmonary veins using ablation techniques and have reasonable degrees of success. But the atrial fibrillation we see in chronic disease in the elderly largely is due to, it's secondary to uh, atrial disease. And very importantly, uh, atrial fibrillation begets atrial fibrillation. So the more uh, atrial fibrillation is the predominant rhythm, the greater uh, the left and right atrial dilatation, uh, the electromechanical dissociation of those chambers occur. And so atrial fibrillation can uh, uh, and does become a permanent rhythm in many individuals if we are unsuccessful in uh, managing the, the uh, abnormality. back into uh, sinus rhythm. Now, the danger with atrial fibrillation is the risk of a stroke, as shown here. So atrial fibrillation, at this point in time, accounts for uh, roughly 20% of uh, all strokes. Uh, atrial fibrillation strokes uh, tend to be uh, larger and um, uh, tend to have greater neurologic uh, permanent neurologic uh, uh, deficits than strokes not due to atrial fibrillation. Uh, importantly, our anticoagulation with warfarin, as shown on this slide, uh, which is very effective, warfarin has a 90% risk reduction for uh, uh, stroke and systemic uh, embolism, is very tightly related to an INR between uh, 2 and 3. 
INR is above three, we begin to have uh, a progressively higher intracranial uh, bleeding risks. INR is below two, we really have a sharp increase in the risk of uh, cardioembolic stroke. But we know uh, that the time in therapeutic range uh, is in with warfarin uh, uh, is related to, again, not only to efficacy, uh, but uh, time in therapeutic range uh, does decline in individuals as estimated GFR uh, declines. And in this analysis here, you can see individuals uh, who have uh, an estimated GFR below 30 or are on uh, dialysis. Those individuals have uh, roughly a 15% drop off in the, or at least 10% drop off in the overall time and therapeutic range compared to patients with uh, with normal renal function. And in uh, adjusted analyses, uh, both renal function and time and therapeutic range were independently associated with the odds of adverse events. So the association of between time and therapeutic range and adverse events is really not modified uh, by differing the um, by differing the GFR. So uh, with atrial fibrillation, uh, we use what's called clinimetric tools. These are scores to estimate the risk of uh, stroke. And in 2002, the CHADS-2 score uh, was first presented. And this is just a way of assigning points to comorbidities, heart failure, hypertension, age greater than 75, diabetes, or a prior stroke or TIA, which had uh, two points, and adding them up. Uh, and then in 2012, this was uh, refined to include more categories and give more uh, specificity with respect to heart failure, uh, with respect to uh, and adding uh, vascular disease and even the lower age bracket and female age. Um, the CHADS and chads vas 2 scores uh, not only predict stroke and atrial fibrillation, they actually predict the development of atrial fibrillation itself. They predict all-cause mortality. Uh, the CHADS and chads vas 2 scores are not uh, specific at all for a stroke. They're kind of general comorbidity scores. Now, what we know is when we apply these scores in the populations and actually look for a thrombus, in the left atrium, in fact, it does hold out. Once we get to CHADS, higher CHADS vast scores of 3, 4, or 5, we start to see meaningful occurrences of thrombus within the uh, left atrium. So this is uh, a check on internal uh, validity of the uh, uh, CHADS vast scoring system. Now, um, the incidence of uh, atrial fibrillation, as I've uh, uh, mentioned, is related to atrial fibrillation risk factors. And so here are some of them uh, uh, listed here. And uh, we can anticipate in some populations that, in fact, um, atrial fibrillation will occur. This analysis was in patients with end-stage renal disease with six or more factors. And it's not hard to get there with respect to age, hypertension, heart failure, peripheral arterial disease. chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So now the teaching point of this slide is among those with end-stage renal disease, as we start to accrue these general, common general medical problems, the risk of atrial fibrillation can approach about 50%. Now, uh, with the CHADS and chads vast score, what we understand in the general population is a score of zero, so no more comorbidities or one. It's reasonable to use aspirin as anticoagulation in 325 milligrams per day what was tested in the early um, uh, uh, stroke prevention atrial fibrillation trials. Once we have a, a chads vast score of two or greater, all experts agree anticoagulation is uh, warranted. And um, in, in here, uh, it's with warfarin and, and with great uh, enthusiasm in the general population, we've moved from warfarin to novel anticoagulants. And with some controversy, uh, the use of uh, both warfarin and novel anticoagulants in patients with uh, kidney disease. Now, um, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, predicted per patient prevalence of atrial fibrillation is related to comorbidities, but across these populations of uh, chronic kidney disease or end-stage renal disease, you can uh, see the point prevalence here uh, ranges uh, anywhere from uh, 1 or 2 percent up to about a quarter of the population of patients having uh, atrial fibrillation. 
Uh, right now, I'm the uh, CCU attending at Baylor in Dallas, and over 50% of our inpatient service uh, has atrial fibrillation as one of their medical problems. This is an important slide, making the point that um, as we have um, worsened levels of uh, uh, renal function, we not only have higher CHADS, uh, uh, CHADS 2 uh, and CHADS vest uh, scoring patients, but we also tend to get a drop off in the frequency of patients who are anticoagulated. So at very high CHADS and CHADS vest scores, uh, patients have so many uh, risks uh, that, in, in fact, many are not anticoagulated. They've had prior intracranial hemorrhage, uh, they've had GI hemorrhage, and we have the such patients on our inpatient service right now. So one way to try to integrate uh, chronic kidney disease and atrial fibrillation is to understand that there is what we call renal vascular remodeling. Uh, and as we uh, develop uh, myocardial disease, uh, valvular calcification, have uh, uh, neurohormonal activation, volume retention, uh, measures of oxidative stress, pro-inflammatory cytokines, and changes in uh, hemodynamics, uh, we really have the perfect setup for uh, the development of atrial fibrillation and this what's called electromechanical uh, remodeling that uh, tends to uh, further progression of atrial fibrillation and make it uh, permanent. We've published on the use of uh, oral anticoagulation in end-stage renal disease, and this is a complicated diagram uh, showing uh, the coagulation system, showing the pathways uh, that are influenced in chronic kidney disease, and, and they will uh, come out in... Um, uh, in uh, uh, um, more of a, um, uh, a, a, a yellow uh, color, not a yellow color uh, here, uh, but importantly, we have um, pixaban, rivaroxaban, and endoxaban, uh, which work as anti-factor 10A or factor 10A inhibitors, and then we have dabigatran as our sole uh, direct thrombin inhibitor, uh, whereas we have warfarin uh, that works. Uh, at the level of uh, factor 10, 9, 7, and 2. So warfarin, in many ways, is a more thorough anticoagulant than these uh, singular agents. And um, in fact, one of the great tests of this is a mechanical where uh, warfarin um, has been shown uh, to be superior and safer than the novel anticoagulants. But atrial fibrillation, the thrombosis risk is less and the thrombus burden is less. And uh, for many patients without chronic kidney disease, the novel anticoagulants now are the uh, drug of first choice for chronic anticoagulation over uh, orphan. Here's where these drugs work. Uh, again, uh, rivarixaban, uh, a, a drug in development, patrixaban, uh, dabigatran, adoxaban, and uh, apixaban. Uh, what you need to know is uh, uh, we believe that uh, apixaban may have um, uh, uh, a, a relatively um, ideal um, uh, positioning with respect to both um, hepatic and, and renal metabolism. And if we look at uh, apixaban, we look at the um, area under the curve, for instance, um, the elevation in drug concentrations with apixaban is less than with rivarixaban, uh, edoxaban, or even uh, dabigatran. So it may be uh, positioned uh, particularly at a lower dose, uh, which, which uh, there is an FDA-approved uh, lower dose of 2.5 milligrams twice a day may be ideal. And when we look with the, within the clinical trials, although we don't have end-stage renal disease, we can organize patients according to uh, a, a renal impairment. Uh, and all the analyses so far, it looks like apixaban uh, has a lower uh, annualized risk of uh, stroke and systemic embolism, as well as major bleeding compared to warfarin. So my, my personal view is that uh, apixaban uh, really could be ideally positioned uh, for a drug to be used, certainly in chronic kidney disease and uh, possibly in end-stage renal disease. So one way to put this all together now is that with atrial fibrillation, uh, we work our way through the CHADS VASC 2 score. Uh, greater than or equal to two patients go on anticoagulation therapy. We counterbalance this against the ble uh, bleeding risks and make a decision with respect to warfarin or a novel anticoagulant or no antithrombotic therapy. 
the majority of patients being on a novel anticoagulant or warfarin. I, and I believe uh, nationwide now, uh, novel oral anticoagulants for atrial fibrillation have exceeded uh, use uh, compared to those with warfarin. So with that, I'll transition to heart failure. So that's kind of a big dose of atrial fibrillation and anticoagulation information. Uh, and now with respect to uh, heart failure, what we know is that there are common signs and symptoms of heart failure, which are in many ways the common signs and symptoms of patients with advanced uh, chronic kidney disease and those on dialysis, including fatigue, effort intolerance, orthopnea, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, dyspnea and rest in, during exertion, um, uh, during physical exam, obviously, jugular venous distension, peripheral edema, tachycardia, and then in, in severe cases, the development of pulmonary edema. And S3 is rarely heard, but it has a, uh, a very high positive predictive value when, um, when it is heard. What we know in terms of cardiovascular disease now from the uh, CKD population is that heart failure is far and away the most common type of cardiovascular disease in renal patients. And I, this wasn't the thinking uh, several years ago where, where there's a big focus on ischemic heart disease, but I believe the Crick study and other analyses have really suggested that heart failure is our big ticket item in terms of uh, cardiovascular disease and the most common reason, cardiovascular reason why patients are hospitalized. So what you need to know about heart failure is all of heart failure can be divided into, in a sense, two phenotypes. One is reduced ejection fraction. Heart failure is shown on the left-hand side of the screen. And uh, our easiest way to classify this is a left ventricular ejection fraction less than 45%. Keep in mind that normal ejection fraction is 55 to 75%. And of those with a reduced uh, left ventricular ejection fraction, about two-thirds have an ischemic etiology. About a third have a non-ischemic etiology. In uh, the remainder, 50% who have preserved left ventricular uh, ejection fraction, so-called diastolic dysfunction um, uh, heart failure, what you need to know there is that the ischemic contribution is much more uh, controversial. It could be as high as um, 50% or so. And so uh, there's still a, a, a great degree of work being done on heart failure with preserved ejection fraction where we don't have established diagnostic uh, strategies or treatments, uh, unlike reduced ejection fraction, of which we have a dozen or more evidence-based uh, treatments. For uh, heart failure, keep in mind that we have both American Heart Association stages of heart failure, which is a disease stage classification, stage A being the risk for the development of heart failure, all the way to stage D, which is terminal heart failure. And then among uh, symptomatic heart failure, we have the classification of symptoms. The New York Heart Association functional class uh, uh, from class one, no symptoms, all the way to class four to severe symptoms at rest. With uh, patients with end-stage renal disease, uh, there has been a proposed classification system looking at whether or not patient symptoms are reversed over the course of dialysis. So with volume and ultrafiltration, uh, do patients improve with respect to symptoms? And when they get to the point of not improving, uh, these patients have a worse prognosis, and this has now been uh, validated. What we know among patients with end-stage renal disease, that patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction have a worsened survival than heart failure with a normal injection fraction, and patients with heart failure at all do certainly do much better. But this analysis suggests that patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction have more than a 50% mortality at 12 months. So as a, for a nephrologist or staff managing dialysis patients, your number one problem on the problem list after their renal disease, in my view, is uh, the presence of heart failure and whether or not they, they have, in fact, established um, cardiac dysfunction. What about our treatments for heart failure? Well, we have quite a building block of treatments for patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. Uh, for those who have residual renal function, we can use diuretics uh, to help relieve signs and symptoms of congestion. For those on dialysis, we have to rely on ultrafiltration uh, to do that. Uh, we can now use uh, beta blockers as well as uh, ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers, a new class of drugs called ARNI, uh, uh, um, which is a um, 
angiotensin receptor blocker combined with a neuropeptidase inhibitor. Uh, the brand name for this is called uh, Entresto. Uh, this now has a class 1A indication. Uh, we can use mineral corticoid receptor antagonists by renalactone and eplerinone, uh, but with great caution for hyperkalemia in patients with renal disease. We can use ivratabine, which is a drug which uh, uh, blocks the uh, uh, so-called um, uh, the uh, IKF channel in the sinoatrial mode and reduces heart rate, so patients in sinus rhythm with heart rates over 70, ejection fraction is less than 35%, they are candidates for ivratabine. Uh, and then we can use uh, forms of uh, implantable defibrillators and pacemakers to improve um, a, a, a survival. Clearly, mechanical circulatory support at the, at the top and, and heart transplant is rarely offered, uh, but they uh, represent the end of the line. What's off to the side now is use of digoxin, which has a very narrow therapeutic range, and as well as a, a combination of hydralazine and isodyl and, uh, and isosorbide dinitrate, as shown on the right-hand side of the screen. And the reason why they're off to the side is that it's probably a risk-benefit uh, relationship, and as we add all these drugs, we lower blood pressure, patients become more difficult to manage, and uh, those two uh, drugs, both the digoxin and then the combination of hydralazine and isosorbide dinitrate, probably have uh, less to add compared to the mainstream uh, drugs. We're very short of information in patients on dialysis, so um, people always want to ask, well, what do we know about beta blockers in dialysis, or ACE inhibitors, or angiotensin receptor blockers, uh, as well as now ARNI inhibiting drugs, and uh, the answer is we have insufficient uh, or absent clinical trials. When we look at observational sources of data, in general, uh, these drugs have been associated with benefit in uh, end-stage renal disease. So those selected for ACEs or ARBs uh, have improved survival. I've published one of the, those analyses as well as those uh, with beta blockers. And with mineral corticoid receptor antagonists, so far the data suggests that uh, those who we select for these drugs in the presence of chronic kidney disease have a worsened survival. And uh, it's not that um, uh, perhaps that's unchecked hyperkalemia. Much more work needs to be done uh, but the, the base of therapy, I think, for heart failure is pretty solid. And as we move into advanced uh, treatments, we have less uh, supportive data and have to use our clinical judgment. Uh, one of the things I wanted to point out is that uh, in the study of end-stage renal disease and uh, use of hemodialysis, in fact, the hemodialysis procedure itself may um, induce left ventricular dysfunction, and the idea here is that end-stage renal disease of patients have chronic volume overload, chronic pressure overload, and uh, the data suggests they suffer in intradialytic uh, stunning, that the process of ultrafiltration and, and everything that uh, occurs in hemodialysis in fact causes transient wall motion abnormalities. Uh, this has all been shown in uh, clinical studies. Uh, and is related to the development of a cardiomyopathy due to the diabetes, due to the dialysis procedure itself. Uh, and once this occurs, there's increased risk of pump failure and sudden arrhythmic deaths. Uh, what we know is that the dialysis modality in the United States may make a difference. Right now, 88% uh, of patients in the United States are in in-center hemodialysis, only 10% on peritoneal dialysis, and only 2% on home hemodialysis. And more frequent dialysis, whether it's done in the center or done at home, uh, and all the uh, clinical trials put together has been shown to be associated with reduction in left ventricular mass, which is a favorable thing, uh, have fewer hypotensive uh, episodes, and the hypotensive episodes we know are related to this intradialytic stunning process, uh, that they on average have a better uh, blood pressures and uh, have a markedly decreased uh, need for antihypertensive. So more frequent uh, hemodialysis from the frequent uh, hemodialysis uh, trials program, uh, in a sense, uh, approved uh, these points. And when we integrate the FHM trial, uh, the nocturnal trial, and the Canadian trials, we show on average here that left ventricular hypertrophy is improved, uh, considerably so in terms of reduction in left ventricular mass. All of these left ventricular mass numbers are still very high, uh, but left ventricular hypertrophy uh, Hypertrophy improves, 
And for each 10-point increment in percentage change in left ventricular mass, uh, there was an associated 28% lower risk for cardiovascular death in these studies. Here are the data with respect to um, uh, in-center uh, three times a week hemodialysis uh, compared to uh, slow uh, daily hemodialysis versus peritoneal dialysis. And, and what you need to know here is that when we can do slow daily hemodialysis, we have a uh, you know nearly 50% risk reduction for hospitalization for heart failure. And so uh, we have improved uh, uh, risks for um, hypertensive heart disease and even ischemic heart disease hospitalization. So uh, home hemodialysis is very friendly from a cardiac perspective. It offers a trade-off uh, with respect to increased infection risks, but uh, for patients with heart failure who could be appropriate for home hemodialysis, the data are strongly supportive of uh, uh, attempting this modality with the goal of reducing the risk of heart failure hospitalization. So in summary, daily home hemodialysis had a 20 to 25% fewer uh, cardiovascular hospital days per patient year compared to in-center dialysis patients, a 25% lower risk for cerebrovascular disease, 41% risk uh, reduction for heart failure, fluid overload, and cardiomyopathy hospitalization, and a 16% lower risk for hypertensive heart disease. So this was an analysis that I published um, last year in the American Journal of Kidney Disease. One more point in here, and a lot of people don't know about this, is that the uh, vascular access may be related to heart failure risk. And what we know here is uh, more distal access points have a lower risk for the development of heart failure. More proximal access points have a higher risk. And the higher the flow through the vascular access, while uh, that decreases the risk of thrombosis and vascular access failure, that higher flow means a higher degree of peripheral shunting. And once we get to about 25% of cardiac output being peripherally shunted, there's progressively higher risks of uh, cardiac failure. In fact, the chamber that fails, that's volume overloaded here, is the right ventricle. And this has now been uh, shown in multiple studies. So we're keeping a watch on these very high flow um, graphs and fistulae and working with our vascular surgeons to try to find that sweet spot with respect to good flow, but not too much for the development of heart failure. And the theory here is um, a ratio of, uh, 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 of the vascular access flow of two liters per minute uh, we figure, you know, that's uh, um, you know, basically about a third of, of cardiac output, that uh, there is an increased uh, risk that with uh, this uh, fistula or graft that there's decreased peripheral vascular resistance, increased cardiac output, increased blood volume return. We have higher right atrial pulmonary artery pressures, higher pulmonary uh, left ventricular and diastolic pressures, this leads to LV dilatation, reductions in ejection pressure, and heart failure. There seems to be an activation uh, of, the, of the neurohormonal systems when we get into this uh, peripheral shunting. So keep this in mind: more than two liters a minute, more than a third, more than a third of cardiac output. We probably over the line with respect to heart failure risks in our vascular access. So uh, to finish and conclude, atrial fibrillation is common in chronic kidney disease, and that our clinometric tools, primarily the CHEDS VAS2 score, now helps us identify risk. Scores of two or greater really need chronic anticoagulation. Uh, while controversial, it appears that novel anticoagulants um, uh, could be a reasonable choice for patients with chronic kidney disease and those on hemodialysis. And if there was a particular drug, my personal view is that it would be a pixaban um, at uh, probably a lower dose of 2.5 milligrams twice a day. Uh, the the um, uh, heart failure is a leading form of cardiovascular disease and chronic kidney disease. The dialysis modality appears to have a dramatic effect on heart failure risk, that is home hemodialysis, much lower heart failure risk, high flow uh, vascular access greater than a third of cardiac output being shunted through the vascular access puts on an additional risk for heart failure, and we may be able to modify that. So uh, now I will return to the question and answer section of this webinar, and I will start with the first question, which relates to the dose of a, uh, dosing of a pixaban. 
So the first question relates to the dosing of apixaban, which is recommended at 5 mg BID unless the patient is more than 80 years old or weighs less than 60 kilos. And so the question, the, attendant, the audience member wants to know if you agree with this normal dose of 5 mg BID in an end-stage rate of disease, as there's a recent study showing more potential for accumulation in steady state. Yeah, I personally uh, I, I disagree with that because that age 80 and 60 kilograms was in patients with preserved uh, renal function, and both age and weight were basically proxies for frailty and bleeding risk. And in end-stage renal disease, uh, I think in general, patients are high in terms of frailty, and they're at pr proven high uh, bleeding risks. So if we... I use our clinical judgment and thinking here. My, my personal view is that it's a Pixaban 2.5 twice a day in end stage renal disease. Perfect. Uh, thank you for that clarification. Um, so, well, uh, the second question is also similar, and the questioner wants to know your overall view on the use of naloxone in dialysis patients, and is there sufficient safety data in your view to use them? Um, I think right now, given the urgency uh, for anticoagulation and end-stage renal disease, that um, we're going to have to go with the evidence that we have right now when we prescribe no X. Uh, there is a, a clinical trial that's ongoing, um, but, but given the fact that the, the uh, sets of guidelines we have uh, basically state that uh, warfarin should not be used in end-stage renal disease, it becomes an ethical dilemma of whether or not we should just not treat patients at all uh, for stroke prevention and stage renal disease, or if we should do something. My personal view is to err on the side of doing something, uh, and a, a reasonable approach, in my view, would be a, uh, would be a NOAC. Okay. And preferably a Pixaban, I, I take it. Yes. And with the caveat that uh, we're looking forward to confirmation from uh, a clinical trial um, that's ongoing. Okay, perfect. Um, the next question uh, uh, states, could patient selection be responsible for the superior cardiovascular outcomes observed with home dialysis, as uh, usually the best patients are selected for this therapy? Yes, I would agree with that, that selection bias plays a large role in the strongly positive outcomes that we see with home hemodialysis. Uh, having said that, uh, when we do adjusted analyses for age and all the other uh, factors, we still see a very large treatment effect. And, um, uh, and I would also say, on the other hand, um, even though better patients are selected for home hemodialysis, all the studies have shown a consistently higher risk of infection with home hemodialysis. So they can't be that good of patients uh, and that good of caregivers uh, because we wouldn't see this counterbalance of higher infection risk. So um, yeah, I'm, I recognize that selection bias plays a role, but I don't think it, it fully explains all the benefit we're seeing with respect to this really dramatic reduction in heart failure. Yeah, and if, if you would permit me, Dr. McCullough, with all respect to add to that, uh, the trials you showed, which were the Frequent Hearing Analysis Network and the Canadian trials, those were actually randomized trials, so um, they, uh, the daily trial in particular showed a regression of LVH uh, in the randomized trial, so there was no selection bias there. That wasn't a home trial, but it was a frequent dialysis trial, which is often done at home. Um, what is your view for treatment in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction in CKD? Well, my personal view about heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is I, I think we've missed the boat with respect to pathophysiology. I think it will turn out to be a problem of myocardial energetics and um, diastole or the relaxation phase of the heart. Um, is much more energy dependent than systole. The heart actually more naturally contracts than it does exp than it does expand to fill blood, and so um, uh, simply trying all the drugs 
that work in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, just trying them with preserved ejection fraction, uh, I think was too simplistic of an approach, and all those clinical trials failed. may fail abjectly. Um, I think it's going to be novel agents that will come to play a role in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. These are going to be agents that change the metabolic activity of cardiomyocytes and really allow them to energetically relax. And most of those agents are very early in development, and so I don't foresee right now any forms of therapy being beneficial in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction or with preserved ejection fraction. The best is that we're going to be able to do is prevention, and that there's a positive story there. Heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. It looks like weight maintenance and weight loss. See, and exercise during life seems to be strongly preventive for the development of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So it's amazing. Several studies now show that exercisers and people who are fit and strong early in life have a remarkable freedom from the development of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Um, and uh, I, I have a question, Dr. McCall. You presented the classification as slightly different in end-stage renal disease, heart failure versus non-end-stage renal disease because it incorporates whether the patient will respond to ultrafiltration. So does that mean that if a patient uh, who presents to dialysis and has a large weight gain and has symptoms of heart failure but is completely relieved after dialysis, would you still call that heart failure or is that not called heart failure? Well, we would call that, uh, let's say that patient has symptoms uh, with, uh, with activities of daily living, we would call that class 3R. That means it's reversible. And um, what we know is that patient has a better outlook than patients who are not reversible, that their symptoms are not relieved with ultrafiltration. So it's really it's really a prognostic classification. But I think the answer is yes, we would we would indicate that they have uh, heart failure. Okay. Okay, I think that's very important to know because um, in a lot of trials uh, for adjudication of events, they often don't code a heart failure that is reversible with dialysis and requires an emergency visit as a heart failure hospitalization. But uh, based on this presentation, well, no, that's true. It doesn't count as a heart failure hospitalization, um, but I think we would classify that patient is having heart failure. And what we know is in the um, observational studies now, the patients that the nephrologists classify as having heart failure compared to those that they classify as just having volume of blood, that those two patient populations have actually a different prognosis. So, so the nephrologists seem to have good instincts in, t in terms of who they're currently classifying as heart failure compared to those that are just classifying as having volume of blood. Okay, that's good to um, And then finally, the last question that's from the audience here so far is, can we use a in patients in dialysis with prosthetic cardiac valves? No, the answer is no. We cannot use a in prosthetic cardiac valves, uh, mechanical prosthesis. Uh, we simply can't do it. Um, there was one randomized trial of a NOAC. It was... Um, it was uh, uh, Perdaxa uh, versus warfarin, and um, it was stopped early due to valve thrombosis with Perdaxa. So we assume that if it happened with Perdaxa, it would happen with uh, the other NOAX. So that's kind of okay. strictly prohibited for mechanical okay. valves. Okay, and we do have one more, a uh, couple more actually. Um, this person wants to know about the use of ACE inhibitors in heart failure when the potassium is high. I'm not understanding the question, but I think what they're getting at is do you have a cutoff for where you would not prescribe the ACE inhibitor in terms of potassium? Yeah, there was one published study uh, years ago in chronic kidney disease and it said when the estimated GFR is below 45, I know that's not very severe CKD, but when the GFR is below 45 and the baseline potassium is over 4.5, that's 
when the risk for serious hyperkalemia begins. So below those two thresholds, there's almost no risk with, at all in the published studies. But once we get above those thresholds, a risk exists. We still use these drugs commonly um, above these thresholds, and we just simply monitor the potassium. Uh, uh, I would say uh, this, that when patients have uh, baseline potassiums that are greater than 5.0, um, I, I think we are um, uh, pushing the envelope with respect to hyperkalemia risk. Now, a newer approach has been to use uh, a potassium-lowering uh, drug orally to actually pull some potassium out of the body and then still push on with the ACE inhibitor. That new drug is called Petiromir, um, and, uh, and, and that can be done. Our nephrologists have done that on occasion. Uh, because everything we can see with respect to ACEs and ARVs, it looks like it benefits patients, even deep into chronic kidney disease, as well as end-stage renal disease, provided we can um, manage the potassium. Okay, that's all the questions we have uh, from the audience. I'd like to thank the organizers of uh, ISN and KDARGO for doing this, and uh, thank you, Dr. McCall, for a lovely presentation and webinar. Okay, well, thank you. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Thank you very much, everyone. And uh, I would just like to add that if you have any more questions, for, uh, you can uh, ask them at education at org, and we will forward them to uh, Peter McCullough. Thank you very much.